Well, brothers and sisters, I have an itch to scratch. It's been about two years since I was able to use a movie reference in a homily, and uh, so I'm going to do that today. Um, that's just COVID meant we couldn't see any movies, right? The theaters were closed. A lot of them were delayed coming out anyway. So, um, you know, I know this is not everyone's cup of tea, but you want to keep your pastor happy, right? You know, so uh, let me scratch my itch. So I'm going to talk about the new Spider-Man movie, No Way Home. And... Um, uh, yeah, I braved a movie theater, but actually it wasn't really brave because there wasn't anybody in it except me. So this movie takes up where the last Spider-Man movie ended, which is uh, Spider-Man is framed by his uh, arch villain Mysterio, and uh, Mysterio has also revealed his secret identity as Peter Parker. So what is our hero to do? Well. Uh, Spider-Man realizes that his family and friends are all now in danger from his enemies, so in desperation he seeks out Doctor Strange, the master of the mystic arts, to see if he can cast a spell so that everyone's memory that Sp uh, Spider-Man is Peter Parker will be erased. Unfortunately, the spell goes awry, and this opens a portal to other dimensions so that other Spider-Man villains now enter into his own reality and threaten Spider-Man and his family and friends. They are intent on getting revenge on him even though this is not the Spider-Man they know because this is from a different reality. They're from different realities. I know it's all very confusing. That's what comic books are really basically. So what does this have to do with our readings today? Well, even though um, these, this particular Spider-Man has done nothing to these villains, they uh, are just seeking to hurt him because they are evil. And uh, Spider-Man, for his part, actually, rather than doing the easy thing and just eliminating them, is really going to try and cure them before he sends them back to their own realities. Now, this group of villains that he fights was known in the comic books as the Sinister Six, and most of them have tragic origin stories. They're not really necessarily villains at heart, but because of circumstances, they have become evil and villainous. So now, uh, when they learn of Spider-Man's plan to try and cure them, some of them are very happy about that, and others are not, because they want to continue and retain their evil ways. So I can't tell you how it ends, but as most comic book movies do, the good uh, triumph and the evil fail, but not without consequences. So this is really kind of the message for us today. Those who do evil things, well, evil will follow them. They will bear no fruit. Those who do good things, good will follow them, and they will accomplish great things. In our first reading from Jeremiah, the prophet says, those whose hearts turn away from the Lord are like a barren bush in the desert. But those who hope in the Lord are like a tree planted beside water whose roots stretch out to the stream and it fears not when the heat comes and it stays green and bears fruit. The same is essentially said in our psalm, good follows good, evil follows evil. And that too is essentially the message of our Beatitudes in the gospel today. Jesus tells us who is blessed in the kingdom of heaven, and it is those who lack what the world offers or who suffer in this life, but do not lose hope in God, for they will receive the reward of their goodness in heaven. 
Similarly, those who seek worldly satisfaction in power or wealth or prosperity or accolades, they will receive their recompense in hell. We have heard this many times from the prophets of the Old Testament and from Jesus himself and indeed from our church. But do we truly embrace it? Being good, following the good, frequently means sacrifice and suffering and even being falsely accused and condemned. And even when it doesn't mean these things, it, can mean, it doesn't mean that we will have a perfect life or that we will be successful in all things or that everything will go our way. What our being good really means is that we will make a difference in the world. It means that we will merit a place with God in his heavenly kingdom. So why then is this so hard to do? Why do people forsake what is good and choose what is evil? Why do they turn away from what is holy and embrace sin? Eventually, I think it comes down to two reasons. The first is that people can delude themselves into thinking that they are doing good even when it is clear that in the eyes of God they are doing evil. These people ignore the scripture and invent their own rules for what is good or evil. This, of course, is a great fallacy. God tells us what is good and what is evil. And I think that deep down in their heart of hearts, they know that they are embracing evil. They know it, but they do it anyway, because they think God will understand. They believe that this because they are quite certain that God must think the way they do. This is human pride at work, hubris, and it infects a great many people. The second reason I believe people embrace evil is because they have rejected the very truth of a heaven or a hell. They don't really believe in a resurrection, so they don't believe in a punishment or a, re a reward, so they seek whatever they can get in this world by whatever means they choose. This is why St. Paul, in our second reading, in his letter to the Corinthians, reiterates the centrality of the truth of the resurrection in our Christian faith. Apparently, the Corinthian community had been influenced by the Sadducees, who believed that there was no resurrection. St. Paul says once again that there is a resurrection. Previously in this letter, he says that there have been witnesses, many members of the Christian community who have seen the risen Christ and can attest to the truth of the resurrection. He says today that without the resurrection, everything else we believe is in vain. And this would be true. How many martyrs throughout the church's history gave their lives because they believed in the resurrection? They could have perhaps lived long and comfortable lives, giving in to those who persecuted them. All it took for those who were being persecuted by the Romans was to desecrate a cross swear once again allegiance to the emperor and forsake your God. But they didn't do that. They gave their lives so as to be witnesses to the world. And they brought about the conversion of millions. How sad would it be if they gave their lives 
for a lie. They did not. And the good fruits of their sacrifice are with us today. So in the end, Spider-Man does good because he has a responsibility to do good. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. That's the keystone of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Marvel uh, comic books. Well, brothers and sisters, we have the greatest power of all, the power of our faith in Jesus Christ. With that great power comes great responsibility to profess our faith, to embrace the way of Christ, and to do good with our lives. And we do so because we believe that in the end, the resurrection will be our ultimate reward for doing so.